Like Harold said, I'm going to be talking about planning dates in Kentucky. And so um, some of this data is a little bit older, but, but I'm, I'm going to kind of talk through the older data and then let you know how we're, we're working through it now. They turned it up. Let me turn, pull that down. So um, <clears throat> just kind of set up. Um, I haven't been in Ohio to speak before, so I just kind of wanted to get an idea of sort of the similarities and dissimilarities between Kentucky and Ohio. And so the first couple of slides are just kind of going through that. And so at least in Kentucky, our total harvested cropland is, is a little bit lower than yours, so Ohio will be in the gray on the right. And, and that really has to do with the eastern part of the state is very mountainous. I'm sure you guys know this. And so um, it's really not croppable. Um, our average farm size, surprisingly, is very similar to Ohio. We're talking about most of our farms are about 170 acres in size. And so we don't have these massive farm field sizes like they do sort of in, in um, Illinois, Ohio, um, or Iowa, and some other places. And so that really plays into um, a lot of the logistical challenges I think that we have in Kentucky and some other states as well. Now in terms of soybeans, we have about 2 million acres. And when we're talking about those 2 million acres, that's not only full season, right, the single season, but we're talking about double crop as well because we do grow a decent amount of, of wheat in the state and so anything that has wheat is almost always double cropped with, with our soybeans. Um, and our average yield is around 52 bushels. Okay, so that's our state average for last year. Um, seems kind of low, doesn't it? Because y'all are closer to 60. Are y'all not... Y'all don't think 52 is too low? It's fairly low, but the problem is we have double crops in there as well, right? So um, NAS, USDA NAS, the Agricultural Survey, doesn't pull out full season versus double crop. And so what you have to understand is this, this average is kind of watered down based upon that, that double crop kind of dragging us down. And I will say that this past year, um, and, and I'll talk about it a little more in a bit, but our, um, our yield contest this year, we had four entries um, that had greater than 100 bushels per acre. And so we, we, do, we do have very competitive um, soybean yields across the state. And in some years, we can get very high yields like this year. Um, two years ago, um, sort of our state, the highest documented um, double crop was 80 plus bushels. 80 plus bushels um, double crop soybeans, right. And so um, sort of the caveat on that entry, it was not managed as a yield contest entry. So I think you should keep that in mind. But it followed canola. And so they were able to plant about two weeks earlier than if they had followed wheat. Um, and they just really, that year, got rain every time they needed it without being excessive rain. And so I think that shows the potential for um, soybeans, at least in Kentucky and other states as well. But 80, 80 bushels for a double crop is very impressive. Um, <clears throat> in terms of wheat, we're down to only about 300,000 acres. That has to do with a lot of things. Um, usually we're closer to half a million. Um, but the last couple of years have been pretty tough on our wheat producers. Um, and actually, um, we turned off super cold and super wet fast. What about y'all? Yes, I see some head shaking. And so actually, we probably had um, probably, oh, probably about 100,000 acres that weren't able to be planted in Kentucky this year because it turned off so cold so fast. Um, sort of the flip side of that on our wheat was that when we did get it planted, some guys planted in a normal fashion, you know, in a timely manner, um, and actually that didn't tiller this year, and so I think we're going to have some, some, some additional problems out of our wheat double crop beans this year. But that's kind of an aside. Corn, um, we have about 1.2 million acres. That's down quite a bit. Um, in Kentucky, typically we've had it as king corn, right? Corn's been sort of the predominant 
um, crop, but over the last few years, just for a lot of reasons, um, marketing prices, soybeans have really skyrocketed. Um, the last two to three years, we've had a lot of continuous soybeans grown as well, um, which kind of boosted our acreage for last year. Um, and there's also some of our innovative guys that are starting to wonder if they should be planting their corn first. And that's something that, that Sean kind of talked about earlier. And so um, I'll be talking about that a little bit more as well. In terms of relative maturity groups, just so you know, most of ours are sort of that 3.5 to late 4 relative maturity groups in Kentucky. We have some of our producers that are growing some, some late 2s and up to 5s. Um, but when we're talking about Kentucky, if you're planning sort of these late twos or fives, those are going to have to go in very early. We're talking April, early May at the very latest. Um, otherwise, you're going to have some problems with um, inner node lengths and um, at least for the two eights, um, pods being near the ground and unharvestable in most years. Um, we always plant 15 inch rows almost always. We do have some that are drilled in seven inches, but, but essentially we have zero acreage in Kentucky on 30 inches, okay? We don't, we don't grow in those wide rows, and that's because of the yield benefits. In terms of seeding rates, what are y'all's seeding rates? I tried to look really quick last night, and Laura can't answer. Y'all have to answer. What, what's the recommended seeding rates in Ohio? 160, did I hear 140? 140 to 160, is that pretty much where everybody's at? 150, so yeah, so that's very similar to kind of what we recommend and, and really when I give my talks in Kentucky, I say, all right guys, what do I recommend for our seating rates? It's a little bit of a trick question, isn't it? Because do the universities typically have seating rate recommendations? Really what we have is, is sort of a, a target harvest population, right? And so that function, there's going to be a function to that, and that's going to typically be germination. But I think pretty well nationally it's established that we want at least 100,000 plants per acre at harvest. And so <clears throat> a couple of years ago when I would survey producers, some of our producers were up to 200, 225 as a seeding rate. Two, two, two to two twenty-five. Okay. Do you think they did that last year? No. No seed costs really skyrocketed the last few years, right? And the prices kind of went down. And so, so in the last few years, our seeding rates have gotten a little more reasonable, in my opinion. But again, <clears throat> I think our guys are a little high. Um, most of our guys are not in the one forty to one fifty, and I'll show that in a bit later. So there's a couple of things that go into the seeding rate function. Germination, what else? What else do you take into account when you're thinking about your seeding rates for your, for your fields? Row spacing, anything else? Planting date, okay, what else? Emergence, so what is it about the planting date and emergence that, that kind of you're accounting for? Soil temperature, but really that kind of comes back to expected stand loss, right? So earlier in the season, you might have a greater stand loss than you would maybe with those warmer, warmer soils, maybe in a, in a May planting date or so. Um, and the expected stand loss can be initial based upon soil temperatures, or it could be just your field history. Um, there's a lot of fields in Kentucky that are surrounded by woods. Um, and so there's a lot of like turkeys and deer that actually come in and just kind of obliterate specific fields, right? And so those producers do have to kind of take into account a little bit higher seeding rates um, to, to kind of get over that wildlife damage. And so in terms of this year, typically I don't spend a whole lot of time on seeding rates, okay? Typically, I'm like, okay, just calculate your seeding rate and you're good, right? Um, you'll also see here that I have seed vigor. Yeah, that's a bad pointer, isn't it? Seed vigor, and we're going to get into that quite a bit here in just a minute. 
But in terms of germination, <clears throat> what are your expectations for your seed lots this coming year for germination rate? High? Somebody said high. <laughs> Expectation, not, not hopes and dreams, right? <laughs> average. Someone says average. Um, in Kentucky, I'm, I'm very cynical this year. Um, so you can see here, this is, this is some pictures we got um, in early September, late, late September, early October from one of our first counties um, that was starting to show problems. Um, sort of in the central part of our, our grain crops production region, they had 85 inches of rain this past year. 85 inches of rain, double. We're talking double what their 30 year average is. So very quickly we started seeing um, pictures from our county agents that look like this. It's not showing up very well, but I think y'all can pick out the phomopsis in this, right? You can see those, well, those white shriveled beans. Um, and actually my counterpart, um, Dr. Chad Lee on campus said, send those samples in to our plant diagnostic lab. And very quickly our diagnostician says, do not send those samples in. Because we had so many samples, they really couldn't process it. And let's be honest, at this point, there's nothing that we could do, right? This was sort of a post-mortem. Um, but even, and I'm not bashing any seed companies, but even once they clean these up, there might be some problems with seed germination. And so, really, this is a very long way of saying your seed germination may be reduced from what you're used to. So check those seed tags very, very critically to see what you've got going on because even with some of the sound looking kernels there may be some phomopsis and so this is addressed in in this blog from the crop protection network from quite a few pathologists and so keep in mind that this this article is is more written by pathologists it has a pathologist slant to it and it's a great article um, but one of the things they really missed or didn't address was seed vigor seed vigor. So, what is the definition of seed vigor? Does anyone want to guess? Anyone know? Maybe we'll start with an easy one. What about seed germination? What is germination? When you look at that seed tag and it says germination, what does that mean? So it's the percentage of those seeds that are capable of producing a normal seedling, okay? A normal seedling. And so there are seeds that will germinate, produce seedlings, but they're just wonky for one reason or another. And you wouldn't expect them to really survive and, and contribute to any sort of yield in the field, okay? And so seed germination is the ability of those seeds to produce normal seedlings. What about seed vigor? It's a very similar definition, right? Anyone want to guess what seed vigor is? So, in a stressful condition, right? So germination, sorry my head cold's getting to me, is under ideal conditions, right? Germination is the ability of, to produce normal seedlings under perfect conditions, ideal, perfect, laboratory conditions where they are controlling for everything. Vigor is the same thing except for it's under stress, stressful conditions. So it's a stress test, right? So having said that, how many of your fields... Well, I won't even ask. In Kentucky, we have zero fields that are under perfect ideal conditions, okay? What about Ohio? I know all of y'all's are perfect ideal conditions, right? So you don't have to worry about seed vigor at all. <laughs> yeah, I'll believe that. <clears throat> so really, this coming year, given the sort of challenges that we had nationwide um, with with our growing conditions in soybeans, I think the seed vigor may be reduced, okay? Not all of the sort of seed bean areas were impacted, but a lot of them were, okay? 
And so I'm not saying that the seed companies are going to try and sell you a bad product. They're going to sell you the highest product that they have. The question is, what is that product going to be based upon, you know, Kentucky wasn't the only place in the state, in the nation that had double rain. Let's be honest. There was a lot of excessive rain this year. And so I think it's going to be very important, and I'm telling my producers in Kentucky, and I would, cons I would encourage you guys too, to, to, to make sure that you understand what that seed vigor is this year so you know where to plant it. And this really comes in and impacts um, when you're looking at, at planting dates as well. And so where is it labeled? Have, has anyone ever seen it on a label? It's not a requirement of the seed label. And so it's something that you have to sort of actively pursue and ask. You probably ask your seedsman, your seed salesman. Um, you could also send it off. Um, in Kentucky, we have a, a lab that will test it. It's our regulatory services. Um, they're kind of under the umbrella of our soil test. And so it is, it's certainly something that you can get measured <clears throat> pretty, pretty easily. And actually, the test that, that most bigger tests are um, for, for soybeans is accelerated aging. <coughs> sorry, sorry about my cold, guys. And so the accelerated aging test, actually, it's kind of an interesting thing. It was developed in the 70s um, to kind of look at the shelf life of um, a lot of different seeds, not just soybeans. But in the 1990s, it's actually researchers at the University of Kentucky, some of them who are still around, if you can believe it, um, are um, developed it as sort of a predictor of field emergence. So really, it was some University of Kentucky researchers that said, hey, we can use this to use as a stress predictor and how well it will emerge in the field. And so from the 1990s, it's been, been used pretty much nationwide <clears throat> what it does is it'll put it into a stressful environment, and by that it's essentially 100% relative humidity at 100 plus degrees Fahrenheit for three days. So it's going to stress that soybean seed lot out, and then they're going to germinate it under ideal conditions and give you um, sort of a ranking. Typically these are not going to be coming back to you as a percentage. It'll come back as a high vigor or a low vigor. And so for sure, if you're looking at early planting dates, you're going to want those, those high vigor lots. <clears throat> those low vigor ones, I would say, are, are going to be problematic for you. And so you want to maybe avoid them as, if at all possible. So expected stand loss is another thing when you're thinking about seeding rates, right? So in Kentucky, I saw earlier a lot of you do no-till, right? So typically we say um, in Kentucky a 10% stand loss for no-till. It's just kind of a, an added stand loss that we expect um, just in the no-till. Again, field history and then throughout the season. And so, you know, as an agronomist, I wish we had a recipe to maximize um, sort of our, our yield potential of any crop. And we kind of have a recipe, right? We have an ingredient list, at least, right? Because the problem with the recipe is that you put in a specific amount of water and heat, right, and temperatures, and, and that's something that we can't control. And so in terms of the recipe list, year in and year out, looking at planting date, seeding rate, and some other agronomic things are always going to be very important. Um, but again, today, it's, it's more I'm going to focus on, on that planting date. And so <clears throat> the story of revising our planning date recommendations in Kentucky really comes from our yield contest. And so my predecessor, his name was Dr. Jim Herbeck. He was there for about 40 years, and he retired in um, 2013 or so. And so he managed our yield contest um, from 1980 on. That's when we started it. Um, and we expanded it to include composition in, in 2007. That's just kind of an aside. And they started it not only to recognize producers, but to document sort of these cutting edge production practices, right? So what are the best producers in our state doing? 
And so actually year in, year out, we're talking about a 30-page sort of summary that's available that, that I summarize so that everyone knows sort of what, what these producers are doing. And that is part of the rules. You have to share that. And so from the mid-80s to actually more like the, the mid-2000s, so about 2010, 11, 12, um, the recommendations from my predecessor was that as long as you plant it by mid-June, you should have maximum yield potential. I see somebody laughing. Thank you so much for laughing. <laughs> so uh, how many of you guys, even in Ohio, would feel comfortable planting in mid-May to mid-June as your optimal planting window? It seems a little off, out of bounds, doesn't it? Particularly, you know, in the early 2000s. And so just as a comparison, you can see here Princeton. This is the, um, this, the station that I'm at. Main campus is here in Lexington, and then I just put it in kind of Columbus, so you can kind of see where we're at. And when we're talking about sort of our production regions, really we kind of cut the state in half and say that this is the western um, sort of grain crop production region. This is more central, and we kind of have a couple of different recommendations, right? And it all has to do with, with temperatures. And so at Princeton, we accumulate heat much quicker. And so you can see here just, just growing degree days um, from mid-May to mid-June. We're talking about a difference of about 500 um, to 200 in mid-May, OK? So we're much warmer in the western part of the state than we are in the central part of the state from about here over. It's usually I-65 is kind of our dividing line where we say central versus western. And so when we look at that, we do have a couple of different recommendations that we'll get to in just a little bit. But basically, Dr. Herbeck was looking at the yield contest entries. Um, and you can notice in the early 80s and even into the 90s, there's very few percentage <clears throat> of yield entries that were planted in April. Okay? There's some years, of course, year in, year out, there's going to be years that you can plant in April and years that you can't, right? And, and so in the 80s and 90s, you can see that. But what you're starting to see here sort of in the late 90s and even into now, just a consistent trend that if you can plant up to 30% of our yield contest entries, that's just the yield contest entries, were planted in April. So actually he said, you know, wow, um, our recommendation is from mid-May to mid-June. Maybe we're off base here, right? And so this is kind of how our yield contest has kind of helps us stay, um, stay on track with what the producers are doing. Um, and it wasn't until about 1999 that any of these April plantings started to be any sort of yield contest winners, okay? But starting in, in sort of the late 90s to early 2000s, most of the April planting were winning awards. And actually, um, 2017, of about five of our, our state awards, four of them planted in April. We didn't have that this year. Um, it was just a wet spring. Most everybody got in more, um, more into May. <clears throat> and so that prompted, that prompted him to look at a study. And so actually it was a six-year study. Um, it's really a long-term study if you think about it. Most, most of us at the universities um, don't get continuous funding for more than two or three years. And so the fact that he had six years of data is really quite powerful. Um, he went from 2006 to 2011. The first few years he used untreated seed. Um, I'm not really sure why he chose untreated seed with these early plantings, but he did. Um, the last two years um, he included a seed treatment. And I have to admit, he, he relayed to me that, that really it was more for the um, insecticide. He got tired of having to spray for bean leaf beetle early season. Okay, 
Um, but of course, it, it also included some fungicides as well. He looked at two relative maturity groups, okay? He did our kind of common um, mid-4 maturity group, but he also looked at a 2-8 as well. And that's because at least in the western part of the state, um, we have a fair amount of producers that are using that 2-8 um, for a marketing advantage, right? And so it, it's not as common in, in the central part of the state, but, but we have a fair bit of producers that kind of spread out the relative maturity groups to include a, a 2-8 to capture sort of higher market prices. And so he included that as well. In terms of seeding rates, wow, he had a range, right? So I told you that our recommendation is closer to what you guys said, you know, 140 to about 160 in most years is going to get us a good, good seeding rate range. Um, but he, you can see how high he went. He even went up to 220. Why do you think he did that? Why do you think he did such an incredibly high seeding rate when he's recommending almost, you know, not quite that high? I'm sorry? For him, it was planting date, but it was the early planting dates he was worried about. He was worried about that stand loss and those April planting dates, actually. Um, our later plantings, um, <clears throat> but you're right about that, too. We do, we do have a little bit higher... Um, seeding rate recommendation on those as well. So it all had to do with the function of the planting date because he didn't want a seeding rate study, he wanted a planting date study. So he wanted to make sure he harvested at least 100,000 plants per acre. And you can see here, um, these are the exact planting dates, but just basically, just notice, he only went from about a mid-April, okay? And then he went to an early July, it's not very uncommon for us to be planting double crop beans in early July. Actually, last year we were planting on July 4th some of our trials because it was so rainy. Um, but <clears throat> he didn't go any earlier than that, um, partially because it typically was so wet he couldn't get planted, right? It's, it's really difficult with those early April plantings. Um, but a lot of our guys in Kentucky are very interested in like the first week of April planning dates. Um, he looked at a lot of things, so he really wanted to capture what was going on to sort of contribute to any sort of yield advantage. He looked at how long it took for the beans to emerge. Um, he looked at nodes and height for two to three years. Um, every year he looked at the harvested plant population because he wanted to, to make sure that he had that 100,000 plants per acre minimum and then calculate stand loss. And so it's kind of interesting that when you look at these early planting dates, it's not all that um, unexpected that it took longer for these April planting dates to merge um, than the July. But I have to admit, I was a little surprised that it took two weeks for them to emerge. Just looking at the data, I mean, it makes sense with the cool soil temperatures. Um, but it's kind of an unsettling feeling to wait two weeks, right, to see if that crop's going to come up and how uniform it's going to be. But, um, but it's interesting. Now, this data was combined over all six years. Um, I kind of want to have a disclaimer here. This was, not, this was not any sort of seed treatment study, but I did pull out sort of the years that had treatments and the years that were untreated to see what the differences were, right? Because you would expect some differences, at least in stand loss, for treated versus untreated. And I wanted to see if sort of the time to emergence there was any effect. And actually the two years that um, had seed treatments, sort of those earlier seed treatments, did come up earlier than the untreated. So we're talking about a difference of a day or two in these April plantings. Um, and actually, all these, although these are not statistically different, there was a one day just sort of difference between treated and untreated, which isn't all that surprising in sort of those dry conditions, right? That it might take longer for the, <clears throat> the water to, to penetrate that seed coat and, and get the, um, the soybean up out of the ground. But keep this in mind, because why? 
And we're talking about April planning dates. At least in Kentucky, there's going to be a risk of a late spring freeze every year, right? There's always that risk. And so, like I said, the western part of the state, you can kind of divide it between central and, and western. And at Princeton, where I'm at, um, sort of if you're looking at the probability levels of freeze, a 90% means that 90%, so 9 out of 10 years, we're going to have a spring freeze on or later than April 8th. Okay? If we're talking about April planning dates, and 90% of the time we're going to have a late spring freeze on or after April 8th, that could be a problem, right? can make you feel a little concerned. Um, because it's not going to be until May 9th that you're going to have only a 1 out of 10% uh, or 1 out of 10 years are you going to have a, a spring freeze that late. Yes? Is that your data or are you getting that from? That's a national database. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have that reference on here, but it's a, it's a climate database from, from NOAA that I got that from. It's a publication. And that should, you should be able to find that for anybody, right, any part of the state. And so that, this is good information because they revise it, I think, every 10 or 15 years. So this is, this is looking at the last, I think, 30 years. And so that's important, right? Because the last few years, we've been extremely variable in our weather patterns. And I think that's something we need to take into account. And so even thinking about that, I think when you look at these numbers, you need to then kind of think, okay, so how quickly do I think these are going to emerge and how long will they be protected underground before they come up? And then kind of back into your, your planning dates. So I have some producers in the far western part of the state, um, kind of closer to this Henderson area. And um, you can see there's a few days difference, about four days difference. And they're wanting to plant like the first week of April. Okay, so they're wanting to prioritize their soybeans and then do their corn later, okay, in terms of, of their, their crop production. Um, and again, I keep telling them, well, you need to really make sure that you are comfortable with the risk of your spring freeze, right, because there will always be that risk. The other thing is soil temperature, right? This is also very universal. You have to have the soil temperature of 50 degrees or greater for the, the best sort of emergence of soybeans. And so when you start looking at it, over the 30 year average at Princeton, we're looking at a two inch um, depth for that soil temperature. Why are we looking at two inches? Why do you think I, I chose two inches? That's right, that'll be about where your planting depth is, right? For the early plantings, I'm telling my guys one inch to one and a quarter, right? I wouldn't go to that two inches in our soil types because you want them to get out of the ground a little bit faster and not be planted so deep. And so over 30, over 20 years, you can see that sure, sort of um, late March, early April, it looks like we're, we're good to go, right? Looks like it. Um, but if you look at individual years, and so these, these are really messy. Understood, these are really messy. But if you look at individual years, you can see that really 10 years out of the 20, you can maybe feel comfortable with an early April planning date, right? Because most of these lines are above that 50 degrees. So half the time you might be able to hit that because you want a consistent soil temperature of 50. Um, about six years, you're going to be talking about more of a mid-April planting date based upon soil temperatures. And actually the last couple years, 2013 and 14, it wasn't until May that we really had appropriate soil conditions. And so even though if you want to target you know, early planting dates, it's going to be really important to make sure that all your ducks are in a row and that all of the other sort of conditions are, are going <clears> to <throat> be amenable for that early planning date for you. 
So any questions on sort of those earlier planning dates and sort of the conditions? Okay. So um, Dr. Herbeck also looked at nodes per plant. And not surprisingly, it's not until you get into these very late planning dates that you're going to be have reduced nodes, um, number of nodes. Similarly, your plant height's going to go down um, with these, these later planting dates. Um, but I think he was more concerned with with the opposite being true, that there was some sort of negative impact um, with these earlier planting dates. Because I know when I came on board, um, he said he was very surprised that, that he could plant so early in April. He really, um, really, it took him a while to convince himself, um, even out of those six years of data. And so again, harvest plant populations. So with these high seeding rates, remember they were 175 to what, 220? So he was able to make sure and ensure that he had at least 100,000 plants that he harvested, okay? And again, this is across all the data. And if you look at seed treatment versus non-seed treated, um, just as we would expect, I'm not surprised at all, those seed treatments actually protected our final, our final um, harvested plant populations, right? And so for our producers, I'm really using these sort of stand loss numbers with the treated seed. Because that's really more realistic. No one, I hope no one's going to go out in April and plant, you know, untreated seed. That's, that's just um, kind of begging for some problems in the long run. So the stand loss, again, we're talking about um, basically from 10 to about 25% stand loss with these earlier planting dates. Okay? And so really, we're not looking at at much more stand loss with these early planting dates than you thought. What would you have, would you have guessed that the stand loss would only be about 20 or 25 percent with April planted beans? I think most of our producers were, were thinking more 30 or 35. Okay? And why do I say that? Because if we start looking at seeding rate recommendations, we have this table actually in some publications of ours. It's just sort of a, a quick reference for our producers to say, okay, this is your standard germ, this is your assumed stand loss, and this is probably the seeding rate that you can look at, okay? And even having said that, we're talking about 140 to 170. And so I gave this talk back in January, uh, or a version of this talk, to my producers that are wanting to go the first or second week of April. And I said, how comfortable are you seeding at about 150 to 170 in April planting. And they all shook their head no and said, there's no way we're doing that. Right? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna increase those seeding rates quite a bit, at least 180. Right? Just for added protection. And so um, I'm not sure I blame them too much, right? Because honestly, for April planting, um, 170 does sound pretty low because that's typically where they're at anyway with their, with their later planted beans. <clears throat> so I say this, but over the last few years, so this is just, again, data from our soybean yield contest. And there were actually... You know, um, back in the early 2000s when, when the, the prices were really high, we had a lot of guys planting at about 2, 225. Even 175 to 200 was pretty normal. Um, and it's not until recent years that they're starting to back off. So the percentage of our, our entries really skyrocketed this past year to most of them being in that 120 to 150 range. Okay? And I think the impressive part about this is that last year, out of the four entries that exceeded 100 bushels, three of them, two of them were planted at 130, one of them was planted at 150, and the state champ, which was 108 bushels per acre, was 163. Three of these, um, one of these was planted in April, the other two were planted early May. And so even with these early planting dates, these lower seeding rates seem to be working 
to maximize yield, assuming you have a harvest population of 100,000 at least, <clears throat> and they're also really minimizing their input costs, right? So this was really impressive to me. So what about yield? So I spent quite a bit of time um, looking at some other parameters, but in terms of yield, looking at these seeding rate, these planting date, <clears throat> and you can't really see it too well. But basically, um, regardless of year, so in 2006, it was the April planting dates. Um, again, April in 2007, but basically our cutoff is that early May. And so all the work he found was that the April, early May planting dates maximized yield, okay? And so sort of the good thing about him doing this for six years is that really almost every sort of scenario was captured. He said there were cool, wet years um, that had plenty of rain. Not really excessive rain, but plenty of rain. He had hot, dry years. He kind of had some, I'm not sure what normal years are anymore, but he said he had some normal years in there as well. And so when you're looking at the sort of possible scenarios for growing conditions over these six years, really we captured them all. And it's good, it's nice to kind of see the, the sort, of, um, sort of range and yield. Um, but really what we want to know is, is where is that window, right? Where is that window and after that window, what is the yield loss? And so we looked at this, we did a, um, a segmented regression and basically all that's saying is, okay, so where is it flat? And although this looks like it has a slope, it's not. It's not statistically different. This is basically a flat line saying from mid-April to early May, um, you have your maximum yield potential. Okay? And after this early May in Kentucky, we have this sort of, <clears throat> this sort of dip in our line that says that's where our yield loss is coming in. And I think every single state in the nation has something similar to this, right? I'm sure Laura has, has these on her website. Oh, you have to stay to 320 to see the Ohio ones. So um, <laughs> that's real incentive to stay the whole day. <laughs> so, but we really, we wanted to know, okay, so what's our window? Our window is until mid-May in, in western part of the state. Keep that in mind. And then what's the yield loss? So if, if I have to plant past that day, what is, what is my expected yield loss? And, and ours is half a percentage point of yield per day. Okay, and so we did it in a percentage basis so that you can take your farm average and plug it in, or field average, you know, so that you know on that field what your yield loss is going to be. Um, not only for your initial planting date, but what about replants? So how wet have y'all been the last few years? Say 2016, 2017, both of those years, I was getting phone calls in August asking what I thought about a replant in the first two weeks of August. They did it. <laughs> you know, I said, well, you know, this is what we expect past May 9th. Um, but, but some of these producers said, I would rather have beans out there than have to mow, right? So we're talking about not just yield potential, we're talking about entire logistics of a farm management. They planted it. One of the producers called me back and said he would never, ever, ever do that again. He said it was terrible. I think it was 10 bushels. And he had a hard time getting them out of the field. He said most of the pods were down on, the, on the, the ground. He couldn't even get them harvested, right? So he said he'd mow the next time. But again, this is a tool that we can use to help our producers understand sort of those risks and where to go. So I kept saying that we kind of have two different sort of zones in Kentucky and so the western part is early May it's more like mid-May in central Kentucky they have a little bit longer window um, and so again assuming a hundred thousand plants per acre are harvested it seems like sort of a universal theme to this region of the United States not only Kentucky but also Ohio 
Indiana, Nebraska, Ohio, Iowa, we're looking at sort of these April planting dates for really maximizing yield. April to, to early May is where we're at, which I found very surprising for such a large geographic region, right? And we're assuming that, you know, we're going to have 50, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. When you're looking at these, there's going to be a couple concerns, of course, sort of these damping off diseases. What about sudden death? Does it, is sudden death syndrome a problem in Ohio? Yeah. So, um, you know, I would not plant those first, but if you've got fields that you can plant that don't have a history of SDS, you might want to plant those first. Right, because those cool wet conditions at planting can be a problem. Um, the pathologists at um, at Kentucky assure me that that sort of the new sort of seed treatments are, are a great, an excellent tool to help mitigate this, so that you can plant timely and you're not losing yield potential based upon planting date. Um, in terms of insects, I kind of alluded to it. Bean leaf beetle is going to be a problem, probably. Is it a problem here in Ohio or no? Not so much, not even early, no. So it's a big problem with our early planted soybeans. Um, I've said most of this. The biggest thing is seeding rates, right? For me, it's seeding rates. Um, our producers, I think, are, are always going to overseed with those early, early planting dates, and I can't blame them at all because that's cheap insurance. Yes, sir. So the question is, um, um, have I looked at seeding rate versus sort of the, the plant type bushy versus, I haven't, no, but, but typically, you know, um, those will branch out, right? So even at lower seeding rates, you're going to get sufficient branching that, that as long as you have 100,000 plants per acre, you're going to be fine. The problem for us is when we get lower than that, um, and, and it's not really yield. Um, per se, because our threshold for replant is around 50 to 60,000 plants per acre. The problem is what? Weeds. It's the weed control and sort of the buildup of weed populations that you may get, and that's usually very undesirable for our guys. So I think as long as you, <clears throat> there doesn't seem to be a whole lot going on there. So what else? Um, actually, I'm finishing up early. Sorry, because my head cold is killing me. Um, but I have all of this um, just recently published in crop management. And so if you actually like want to look at all this data and sort of just, because um, it's such exciting data, wasn't it, guys? Yeah. Oh, I've already lost you. I've already lost you, right? <laughs> Um, but but um, this is all published, and you can you can access it at any time. So, what other questions do you guys have? Thank y'all so much. Yes. Are you looking at earlier planting dates? I guess April fifteenth. We are. So the question is, are we in Kentucky looking at earlier planting dates? Yes. We have producers that want to go the first week of April. Probably not earlier than that because our soil will not, is not going to be at 50F. I, you know, in most years we are not going to have that consistent 50 degree soil temperature. And that's the, that's the thing, it's consistent. The expectation when you plant is that the soil will stay about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Because otherwise those plants are going to struggle and your emergence can be problematic. And your stands can be spotty. So for us, no, most of our guys are looking at, I mean, we're talking about April 1 planting date, though, you know, that's what they're wanting this year. I'm not sure they're going to get it because the rains and different things are killing us down there. What other questions? Thank y'all so much. I enjoyed. We got one more back here. Emerson. Do you see uh, uh, replanting much more common with early planting, or doesn't it make much difference? So Emerson asked if we see more replants with the Aprils. No, typically not. Typically, I'm not sure why, but, but those seem to be protected and, 
and when the stress hits or whatever's been going on the last few years, they're far enough along that that they're fine. Just as an observation, replanting doesn't is not usually avoided by overseeding or feeding a higher rate. If we have a disaster after we plant, which is two inches of rain, we're probably going to replant anyway. Yeah. Uh, and so it doesn't make much difference when it is, and it doesn't make that much difference how many we plant. That's true. The, the observation is that even when you overseed, you're not going to avoid a natural disaster. And that's true. But sometimes, you know, increasing that seeding rate 5 to 10 percent so you can sleep better at night is worth that money, right? So um, that's what my guys tell me all the time. So thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Let us thank Carrie.